I will discuss about uh, functional microdomains in cardiomyocytes. But before this, I want to talk about people who made my journey here possible. I was born in St. Petersburg, in north of Russia, three hours flight from here, but snow six months. St. Petersburg was founded by Peter the Great and uh, was the capital of Russia for a long time. St. Petersburg is home to Dostoevsky, Pushkin, Mariinsky Bali, and I was very happy to grow up in such a cultural environment. My education never would have been the same. It was not my amazing family. My mom here in the audience. They both were engineers. My dad passed away when he was 45 years old and I was 19. My dad has been amazing influence and he was inventor and he was um, engineer and he had more than 60 patents and he played piano, he wrote poems and novels, he loved art and he wanted me to be an engineer. But he always said me the main things in life is to be creative and his work and his words just helped me to navigate my entire life. When I was 14, I went to secondary special grammar school in maths and physics. We have uh, brilliant teachers, not only in maths and physics, but only in biology and chemistry. It was a tough education. We have a lot of exams every term from the professors from the uh, many St. Petersburg University. But in the end of the school, I was overloaded by physics and I decided to go to biology and chemistry area. And I decided to go to medical school, to be honest. But it was the special requirement for medical school this time. And uh, you need to go uh, to the hospital and work for two years, or you need to go to factory and work as a factory worker for one year. And uh, uh, in Soviet Union, the working class were encouraged to go to medical school. And my dad sent me to go to factory. And I went to the factory, uh, factory making the paper, and I was responsible for blow the horn in the, <laughs> sorry, where is horn? Because it was horn in the beginning. Thank you. So, it was good because I saw the real life. But after a year uh, in factory, they changed the rules. I really, I couldn't enter to medical school. And I apply to study biology and chemistry to the university, St. Petersburg University for teachers. And I was lucky because from year one, I started to work in the laboratory in the genetics department. Um, our head of the department was the Professor Schwarzman, who was the student of the famous uh, Soviet genetic uh, Lobachev, and this is the first book, one of the first book, uh, which was published after rehabilitation in, um, of genetic in Soviet Union. And we uh, who study biology in Russia, we everybody knows this book. Uh, Professor Schwarzman's nickname was the chief, 
it was very informal atmosphere in the laboratory. In this laboratory, just I uh, learned uh, how to perform experiment, how to change experiment, and how to get the unexpected results. Uh, Chief uh, always told us that uh, education and science is a fun. And uh, potentially this you can answer any scientific question and you need to open the book. But the only question you need to know which book you need to open. So um, from first month of my work in the laboratory, I start to read the scientific literature. And my master student thesis was about the uh, uh, melanotic tumor on the eyes of the drosophila. And this time, I already have my daughter, Paulina, and I'm looking for Paulina, and I uh, uh, had a tube with flies in my kitchen and stereo microscope, and I tried to count my flies. But it, Paulina was 20 months old, and she loved to open the tube and set up these flies free and fly, go through the window. So after my master thesis, I apply for the PhD position in Institute of Cytology, Russian Academy of Science, and I was invited to interview with the Professor George Pinaev. Professor George Pinaev, uh, before became the professor of biochemistry, he was the ballet dancer. He uh, um, danced for the Mariinsky Ballet, and he set up the amateur company in our Institute of Cytology, and I was a part of this company, and sometimes we perform uh, in the new year, but it's here. Uh, it was the more than 20 different ballets. But in the first interview, he um, said this, are you ready that 90% of all your results will go to rubbish bin, and only 10% will make a difference? And I say, okay. Uh, but I always remember these words, it's true. But I was responsible for developing a new cellular technique for uh, grow in vitro a la uh, pl plast of the keratinocytes for grafting uh, to burn patient. And my PhD thesis was about the differentiation of keratinocytes and the influence different components of extracellular matrix. And I was one of the founder of the first center for cellular technology in St. Petersburg. This center is still working. So after a PhD studentship, I uh, tried to apply for the postdoc position. And I was invited to the uh, really new laboratory, the young lecturer, uh, Yuri Korchev, who here in the audience, uh, who developed a brilliant technique, a scanning and conductance microscopy technique, um, high resolution technique for study living cells. So the, he used the glass micropipette as a sensitive probe and one electrode inside pipette, one electrode in the solution, and he introduced the electronic feedback control which keep the distance between pipette and cell always constant. And uh, uh, during the scanning, we can pick up the vertical displacement of this pipette together with current and produce the topographical image of the live cells. So I was impressed with this technique. Yuri invited me first for one month. And uh, uh, really this I knew cell biology little, so I knew there's some um, cell culture work, I knew the other work, but I never ever used any electrophysiological technique. And I was scared of this microscope. But in the middle of my visit, Yuri had a flu and stayed home. And I decided to try to scan. And Yuri called me and navigated me by phone. And when he came back, I got my first scan and uh, really this, my journey in this area began. And Yuri asked me, Julia, I have a, this wonderful microscope. What will do with this microscope? And I was responsible for next seven years for application of this wonderful technique to cellular biology. 
During the next seven years, we scan the different type of cells. In the left panel, you have a movie, 24 hours movie of low resolution, uh, epithelial cells movement, and you can see this, how cells communicate each other. You can see the junctions between cells and projection of the cell surface. Here, we found the uh, structural microdomain of epithelial cells microvilli can be very dynamic. And uh, they have a life cycle and they can live only 12 minutes. And it was the first example of the microdomain of the membrane microdomain of the epithelial cells. It means every 12 minutes, all channels and all receptors in this microvilli can change. So, okay, we can scan, we can resolve the structure, and we publish the, uh, our PNS paper in 2003. So we can resolve the uh, microdomain on the surface, for example, in epithelial cells, but how we can target the, any protein on the surface, any fluorescent part on the surface, and we decided to combine our technique with the fluorescent technique. And this time, the young PhD students with mathematical background, Andrew Shevchuk, came to Yuri's lab. And he helped with the software development and with the development of a different combination of this technique. And um, we combine the scanning and conductance microscopy first with confocal microscopy. When we position the laser beam in the tip of the pipette, and in one goal, we try to scan the cells and detect the fluorescent particles, sorry, in the membrane of the cells. And we found the uh, virus-like particles, fluorescent-like uh, particles can go through the cavioli-like structure in the COS-7 cells. And uh, okay, this we thought, okay, we can detect some fluorescent particles on the surface. In this situation, we maybe can match the alive receptors um, in the surface in the different microdomains. And uh, we publish uh, another PNS paper about this scanning surface confocal microscopy. But uh, also another, um, another com combination of the technique was the smart patch clamp. When you use, oh, I'm just, sorry, it's just, Mouse is very nervous. <laughs> so, scanning and conductance microscopy technique and the patch clamp technique both use the glass micropipette as a sensitive probe. So first, you're scanning the object. Second, you can uh, find the area of the interest and just uh, a position pipette on the area of the interest. And third, you can switch off feedback control and patch the area of your interest. And we can detect the alive ion channels on the tip of the microvilli. And uh, uh, it was the amazing technique. We published a couple of papers, but more important, using this smart patch technique, we can find the mechanism of aldosterone action for the sodium channels. And uh, uh, Professor Chris Edwards, who here in the audience was Yuri's mentor, who was very interested in how aldosterone works in the epithelial cells. And we found that without the aldosterone stimulation, uh, when we patch the epithelial cells, we cannot get any sodium active channels. But after aldosterone stimulation, we found the uh, swollen cells, and these swollen cells have uh, active sodium channels, and we named this structure chessboard structure, and we published another PNS paper. So, during my work in Yuri laboratory, I scanned a lot of different cells, sperm cells, uh, 
neuro, uh, I can resolve the neural synapse, uh, melanocytes, epithelial cells, but I like my favorite cells always was the cardiomyocytes. Why? Because cardiomyocytes is very, very good structured cells. And cardiomyocytes have a lot of uh, structural microdomains. And structural microdomains in cardiac cells are not very dynamic. So see on these beautiful cells, you can see here the titubal open areas, Z growth, and uh, also sarcomeric structure. So I really start to think how different receptors and channels located in these beautiful cardiomyocytes microdomains. So in this time, other Yuri's mentor, Professor Max Lapp, tried to convince me to do the more cardiomyocytes work. And in this time, we start to use our surface confocal microscopy for study rhythm and calcium dynamic in one goal. Uh, um, and uh, we study contraction of neonatal cardiomyocytes because we uh, stay with our pipette in the center of cardiomyocytes and we uh, detect the vertical displacement of our pipette and we measure the rhythm of contraction of neonatal cardiomyocytes. And when we position laser beam on the tip of the pipette, in one goal, we measure the calcium dynamic. So it was the perfect model for antiarrhythmogenic drug screening. And we try to screen the, some drugs and we publish a couple of papers with Max. So next door, uh, this time, Based the uh, young lecturer, young group leader, uh, Professor, oh, now Professor Catherine Williamson. Uh, she's a medical doctor and she studied uh, obstetric cholestasis disease um, when the pregnant women had a high level of bile acid in their blood. And uh, um, baby died in the uh, third trimester of pregnancy. Baby died because the heart was stopped. And uh, this baby had a fetal arrhythmia. And uh, a cat, looking around, uh, tried to find the suitable cellular model for study dangerous bile acid. Uh, TC, taurocholic acid, this is a bad bile acid. I will, for general public, I will tell about the bad bile acid and good bile acid. So it was bad bile acid. And we try to check this bad bile acid with our neonatal cardiomyocytes model. And we found that in control, all cells contracting together. But when we add bad bile acid, we can watch arrhythmia. And we try to check the clinically useful for this women drug, good bile acid, UDCA, and we uh, got the protection from this arrhythmia. And we published several papers, but we have a lot of question unanswered question. We have a lot of question and we wanted to find the receptor that bind uh, bile acid. We wanted to find the mechanism, how UDCA works. So a lot, a lot of questions. And in this time, I met Professor Sean Hardin, who is a specialist in the cell signaling. She came to URIS lab when she read our surface confocal paper, and she wanted to target the um, beta adrenergic receptor using the um, dye and using, and using our surface confocal setup. We uh, wasn't su successful this time, but we established very good successful collaboration in the future, and um, we start scan more and more uh, cardiomyocyte cells, and I start to use the uh, stem cells derived cardiomyocytes from Shan's lab. And these days, I try to look in for special index which can characterize myocardial surface structure. And we name this index Z groove index. Z groove index is ratio visible Z grooves after our scanning to the predicted Z groove in the scan. So, in 
you have good structured cells, you have a Z group index around <coughs> one, simple. So we publish our paper a little bit later in cardiovascular research. So uh, in the 2005 or 2006, when I apply for a lectureship position to National Heart and Lung Institute, I already knew what I want to do, and I wrote the plan, and it was uh, two directions. So first, I wanted to study bile acid, good and bad, and fetal heart. And the second, I wanted to study the functional microdomain uh, of the cardiomyocytes and disease uh, in, some, in health and disease, and uh, functional microdomains, uh, mainly the L-type calcium channels and beta-adrenergic receptors. In the interview panel, there were many people, and uh, Professor Philip Fulwilson, Wilson, who was the head of NHLI, he likes, not technique, he liked uh, my UDCA stuff because he used the UDCA for treatment of heart failure patient. And he was very excited. I, I'm doing this also. And uh, Professor Alan Williams, who is here in the audience, he was my first line manager. And he uh, just supported me a lot. And he uh, offered me this space in the basement. It was an amazing space in the con concrete floor because it's very suitable for electrophysiology. And I have a lot of space in Brompton. And I was very happy uh, next six, month, uh, six years in uh, Guy's Garden building before we move here. So I started my laboratory and uh, with the first direction. So first direction, bile acids as signaling molecules in the heart, role in fetal heart. And I was very, very happy to have my first uh, PhD student, Hamima, who came from Malaysia, and she is now a lecturer in Malaysian University. And she did a great job. She found the bile acid, uh, bad bile acid, can bind the muscarinic receptor, and the bad bile acid, the uh, partial agonist of muscarinic receptor. And when we knock down uh, muscarinic receptor in cardiomyocytes, that prevent this bad arrhythmia. Also, Hamima used the stem cells uh, derived cardiomyocytes from Shan lab, but she used the stem cells as the first model for uh, study fetal heart. And uh, honestly, these stem cells derived cardiomyocytes were perfect model for study fetal heart. So, uh, and she checked the, this bile acid using this uh, model of uh, stem cells derived cardiomyocytes. So the, we try to, uh, second part, we try to answer the question about protective effect of uh, good bile acid, UDCA. And it was the uh, Dr. Michele Miragoli who came to me and did the postdoc with me, and now he running the two labs, one in Milan, one in Parma, and live between these two labs. And um, so he, first of all, he found that um, uh, during the third trimester of pregnancy, the uh, in fetal heart, um, the cells named the myofibroblasts appeared, but this myofibroblast, which express smooth muscle actin, disappeared after uh, birth. And he found the bad bile acid uh, induced arrhythmia in in vitro model of fetal heart. He just set up the special cellular model, um, cultivate together myofibroblasts, and uh, cardiomyocytes. And he found that after application of the dose of the bad bile acid, this uh, 0 0.5 millimole, uh, this concentration sometimes uh, mothers have in their blood. 
After application with this strong dose of the bad bile acid, we can watch the huge arrhythmia and we can see the re-entry in this model. But surprisingly, oh sorry, surprisingly, oh my God, sorry, uh, yes, good. Uh, when we add bad bile acid, together with the good bile acid, UDCA, we don't have any arrhythmia in this in vitro model. And good bile acid in the very, very low concentration. We have a perfect propagation through entire model without any re-entry. And he found the mechanism of this, and he found the UDCA just affect the myofibroblasts, hyperparalyze this myofibroblasts through the potassium channels. So we published uh, this paper in Hepatology Journal, and it was very, very interesting story about this publication. When this publication just must be in the uh, in press, I got a phone call and said, Julia, you're on the BBC News. And you, your name in the photo of bears. And during the next three days, I got more than 200 photos of bears <laughs> and the titles, Bear Chemical Brings Heart Hope. Bear Biles Could Help Heart Attack. And it was quite OK. But I even can find the polar bear. And uh, what? After three days, I got a phone call from the editor from uh, Animal Asia and said, Julia, it's a really noise around the world because uh, people, uh, animal, uh, people for animal rights who always fight for animal rights, they thought I used the bear in my research <laughs> because in early days, people uh, use in Chinese medicine, use the bare bile in the Chinese medicine, but I use synthetic UDCA. And uh, they said, Julia, you need to write a letter, and you need to, uh, you, you need to write, I'm Julia Garelic, uh, never use the bear in my research. <laughs> I'm Julia Garelic, not recommend to use the bile. I said, okay, I never see the any bears in my life. I work in the basement. I have biophysics. <laughs> and just they said, no, you need to write it. And I wrote this, but it was my lesson, how uh, I'm really very calm with any journalists and uh, just not really, and pay attention. Every verses you need to check before speak with journalists. So, from this part of work, we have a lot of unanswered questions, and we try to answer this question now. What other receptors in cardiomyocytes involved in fetal arrhythmia and this bilastin-induced arrhythmia? And we now um, try to study the another bilastin receptor, TGR5. And also, this what is the protective mechanism of UDCA treatment on the whole heart level? And, uh, this question, this, I think it will be answered to the next several years. But my main interest and my main direction in my research always was related to the cardiac cellular microdomains and health and diseased heart. It was, uh, this is a, sorry, I, this is a, my first technician, Alexei Moshkov, who built the first microscope in my laboratory. And in this time, we have a brilliant postdoc who now is a lecturer in Queen Mary, uh, Mary's University, Pavel Novak, who introduced the new uh, software and new mode of our scanning and conducted microscope. When the pipette the, uh, tried to hope from the fixed distance, and th with this hoping mode, we can not only scan the cells, we can also scan the open aorta, cardiac valve, and other 
tissues. And from this time, I start to use the hoping mode microscopy in my laboratory. So, first of all, I decided to check the structure of the control cardiomyocytes and compare uh, structure cardiomyocytes from control heart uh, with the cardiomyocytes uh, from the failing heart. And it was the young PhD student who now the senior lecturer here, Alex Lyon, who developed the model of myocardial infarction, 60 weeks of coronary ligation, and we used this model in our research. And we found that in the control heart, cells have a very good structures and very good tubules development. And in the cells, which isolated from the myocardial infarction animals, we have a very low tubule ratio at the groove ratio. And these structural changes correlate with functional changes. Also, we screen a lot of human cardiomyocytes from heart failure patients. We isolate cells from biopsy and just uh, we uh, compare the cardiomyocytes from dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic heart disease, and obstructive cardiomyopathy. And we found that they uh, all have a very low t tubule ratio and very low Z groove ratio. And these changes in structure correlate with their function. Also, we check the cardiomyocytes from uh, another model, me mechanical unloaded heart, which was developed in the uh, Cesare Cerziano laboratory. And we found that these uh, cells from unloaded heart have also very low z group index, and this correlates with the uh, abnormal function of these cells. So we found that with the different disease change the surface of the cells. But what happened with the nanostructures? What happened with the small microdomains? And uh, I try during the uh, five or seven years, I try to answer uh, these questions. How signaling microdomains are organized and where are they located? What is the relationship between the structure and function in these compartments? And how these compartments change at heart failure? And do changes in structure of compartments in heart failure affect their function? Okay, before we did the structural experiment in one population of the cells and functional experiment in another population of the cells. And I decided to do the, some combination of technique and study function and structure of the cells in the one goal. And uh, I use, uh, used in my laboratory technique was developed in Yuri Korchev laboratory, so scanning and conductance microscopy. Scanning and conductance microscopy with confocal microscopy to, uh, to study the T-tubules and the network of the T-tubules. Also, in my laboratory, we developed a, a combination of scanning and conductance microscopy, pressure application, and calcium recording for uh, study mechanosensitive microdomains. And also, we used the super resolution scanning patch clamp for study uh, localization of channels of the cardiomyocytes. And the new um, Combination um, scanning and conduct microscopy and FRED technique were developed in my laboratory in 2010. So, when, so this is a main project. This was running in my laboratory. This un, not only project, but some sort of direction. So, localization of beta adrenergic receptor to surface structure, special localization of L type calcium channels and its modification during the heart failure. A coupling of L-type calcium channel with beta adrenergic receptor in cardiomyocytes from normal and failing ventricular cells. But also, we start to study the microdomain specific localization and regulation of L-type calcium channels in atrial myocytes. So, for first couple of projects, uh, we develop the combination of scanning and FRED technique. Because we started to study, to, to try to study 
the localization of the beta receptor using the our surface confocal with the fluorescent dye with shan the long time ago but unfortunately the beta adrenergic receptor have a Really, this very low expression, it's very difficult to target specific receptor in the surface of the cells. And uh, everybody knows that beta-1 adrenergic receptor and beta-2 adrenergic receptor have a different function, but they have the same uh, second messenger, cyclic AMP. And we decided to check the differences in special localization of beta adrenergic receptor on the surface of normal and failing cells using the new combination of our technique with FRE technique. I apply two times or three times to get a grant for this work. And uh, uh, this grant was uh, two times. It's been rejected because they said this, this grant is very ambitious. You never can do it. But I met young PhD student Slava in Würzburg and I already had this idea to combine the scanning and FRET. And Slava was the person who developed the special FRET sensor for detect the cyclic IMP during the local application and during the local activation of beta adrenergic receptor. FRET sensor has a two fluorophore, YFP and CFP, and a sensor domain which can sensor cyclic IMP increase. And Slava developed the adenovirus with this sensor. And uh, our idea was very, very simple. We can infect our cardiomyocytes with this sensor. After, you can scan uh, cardiomyocytes and uh, resolve the microdomains, so t tubal open areas or the crest areas. And the second, you have the stimul inside the pipette, and you apply the pressure and you can activate locally your receptor and measure FRET. I will show you cartoon, and I think it's easy to understand. So, uh, first, you scan and you resolve the T-tubal open area. Second, you apply the pressure and apply the signal through the pipette. Cyclic MP goes up and your uh, FRET ratio drops. In this situation, you have receptor here in the T-tubules. If your flat ratio not drop, you don't have receptor in the, this area. So what we found? We found that in the normal situation, in control cells, you have a beta-1 cyclic IMP signaling in the crest and also in the T-tubule. But in sharp contrast, you have beta-2 cyclic IMP signaling only in the T-tubules, no in the crest. So when we use our model of heart failure, 16 weeks of coronal ligation, and here you have a very bad surface structure of the surface, but at some T-tubules still visible in the surface. In this situation, beta-1 receptor you can see in the crest in the T-tubule, but beta-2 receptor uh, also in the T-tubule, and in the crest. So you have uh, some sort of redistribution of functional beta-2 receptor from the tubule to the crest. And more interesting, when you apply your signal through the pipette in this area, in the healthy cells, you have a local signal of beta-2 receptor only in the T-tubule. But in the failing cells, your uh, signal from local became global. So we conclude that, that functional beta-2 adrenergic receptors are normally located exclusively in the T-tubule of healthy cardiomyocytes. And in heart failure cells, beta-2 adrenergic receptors redistribute from T-tubule to the crest. And uh, uh, I got the Research Excellent Award, uh, Rector Award of Research Excellent for this work, and I was a team leader. Uh, who received this award. So, but it's okay. Beta-2 adrenergic receptor redistribute from tubule to the crest. But what we need to do to really try to do the some sort of redistribution back this beta-2 receptor. 
So, and other projects, what we really set up after this science paper, we try to find the conditions when we can improve the redistribution beta-2 receptor back and when we can uh, really improve the, let's say, the retabulation of our uh, heart failure cells. So it was a talented master student in my lab and he, after master student, he did the PhD with me and after PhD, he decided to do the first postdoc with me. Uh, Peter Wright, who studied the covalent free and cavioli, how they regulate compartment of beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Cavioli in neonatal myocytes and in uh, adult myocytes, the other important microdomains. Cavioli, the invagination, or the, this is a lipid draft with the uh, protein caviolin, and uh, this is a signalosomes, and the cavioli accumulate a lot of channels and receptors. And we found when we insert when we insert the adenovirus with covalent 3, we have more covalent in the surface of the cardiomyocytes. And when we infect the cells with the mutant uh, covalent 3, we have a less covalent in the surface. And more interesting, uh, when we have the mutant covalent 3, we don't have beta 2 receptor in the T-tubule. We have our global signal. And when we uh, express covalent 3 in our heart failure cells, we got the localization of our beta 2 receptor back to the T tubules. So we conclude that covalent 3 play a crucial role for localization of beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And overexpression of covalent 3 in failing myocytes can partially restore the disrupted localization of this receptor. So the second participant is a CERCA 2A ATPS, the calcium ATPS, and uh, everybody knows now the uh, successful CERCA 2A gene therapy. We present a new therapeutic strategy for chronic heart failure. And uh, Sean and Alex now successfully had a clinical trial ongoing in human with CERCA 2A gene therapy. And here this we wanted to study the benefit of circuitoy therapy for normalization of beta adrenergic receptor signaling and localization of beta 2 adrenergic receptor to surface structure. So Alex inject AV9 virus with circuito A to the red after myocardial infarction, after 16 weeks of coronal ligation, and we isolate cells for six weeks after this injection. And we isolate cardiomyocytes and we check our beta receptor uh, distribution and uh, also morphological, topographical images of these cells. And it was very amazing. After heart failure, you have a very low z groove index and t tubule density. And after circuit therapy, the z groove index goes up, t tubule density goes up, and what more important, we have a uh, stack. It's more important. We have a stack in the system. And uh, uh, more important, the circuit to a therapy, just uh, beta 2 receptor go back to the tubules. Something wrong technically, could you help me? Because it's, uh, we, yeah. It's not my fault, just stuck. <laughs> just stuck. Sorry, I can speak, of course, but it's really it's, uh, a lot of amazing pictures. I'm just, uh, I can do the, I can show the Z groove, striations. Really, there's a good Z groove index here and bad Z groove index here. <laughs> I can also show how the pipette works and how we can do the new techniques. And uh, it's 
You cannot? Uh, no? Okay. I can, I can try restarting it. Oh, you can, okay. So, okay, so I will continue, and uh, after that it's, he will restart, and I will show you more pictures. So, it was amazing that the uh, circa to aging therapy can help uh, with the restoration of the beta 2 receptor signal back to the T tubules. But what happened with the L-type calcium channels distribution? And we use the new techniques, and I have a beautiful movie of this new technique, and this new techniques was developed uh, by Pavel Novak, and this new technique before, we used the, our sharp pipette, and we used the same pipette for patching. But our sharp pipette has a very high resistance, and we cannot really record a lot of channels with the small, small area around the 50 nanometers. And Pavel got a big improvement. And first we scan with the sharp pipette and resolve the Z groove and T tubule open area. And after that, we go outside of our surface and we clip our pipette. And we clip our pipette with a special program and diameter of our pipette became comparable with our t tubules. But we already have a map of our surface and we already have our t tubule open area. And with this widening pipette, with the clip pipette, we go back, for example, this is a t tubules, this is a t tubules, and we go back and, with, and we can record the functional ion channels from this t tubule open area. And it was a very uh, big improvement because we can record a lot of channels. And we published a circulation research paper about this new method. And this circulation research paper in 2013, five months was the top of download, top download papers in this year. And we found the all functional L-type calcium channels located uh, in the uh, ventricular cardiomyocytes located mostly in the T-tubule area. And um, uh, in the crest, we found only the 6% of uh, all functional calcium channels. And this is correspond with the Steve Hauser paper uh, when he showed the uh, L-type calcium channels in cavioli-like structure not effect to the excitation contraction coupling. So we detect the L-type calcium channels in the control cells, here with the stations, and also in the heart failure cells when you have not a lot of structures. And we found uh, if in the control variant we don't have any functional channels in the crest, in the situation in the heart failure we have a lot of functional channels in the crest with the changes in uh, channels characteristic. And it was amazing. And now we try to find the mechanism why during heart failure all our channels move to the crest. And uh, the main question, do we have a, a relocation of the channels or do we have the normal channels, but they're not functional in the crest? So now also this we use the atrial cells because it's the people never think about the T-tubules in atrial cells because it's a, it was the dogma that atrial cells uh, don't have T-tubules. But we check the uh, red atrial cardiomyocytes and we found the uh, Thirty percent of cells in the left atrium have the uh, uh, tubules, and we study the uh, functional distribution of channels in the atrial cells, and we found the uh, L-type calcium channels in atrial cells everywhere compared with the ventricular cells. We found the functional ion channels in atrial cells in the crest and in the T-tubule also. So now we are studying the combination of all this technique, the FRE technique with patch clamp, and we study the coupling 
L-type calcium channel with the beta adrenergic receptor. When we activate our L-type calcium channel through the pipette and see how the agonist to the beta adrenergic receptor can affect the biophysical characteristic of L-type calcium channels. So, yes, please. Okay, so uh, also important, uh, we, I show the slides probably for the three minutes after my explanation. I think it's something wrong, I don't know what's wrong. But uh, also the, we not only study the cardiomyocytes, we also uh, study the different other disease with the collaboration with the people from NHLI. So we, uh, using the combination of the scanning and conductance microscopy uh, and the pressure jet, we apply the pressure through the pipette and uh, after application pressure through the pipette, we can just detect the compliance of the different cells and we can detect the compliance of the different tissues. And uh, we study the compliance of the different part of the peak aorta. Also, this, we study the compliance of the cardiac valve. And uh, also, um, I will, I hope I will uh, show you our other applications. Uh, you have a computer, but do we have, where is my hard drive? Who knows where is my hard drive? You don't know, thanks. Okay. Okay. So, what I, I hope it will be soon, but it's, I just really, I remind the one Russian film in the museum about the crown, when they wait in the crown and the, person start to really this, discuss about some fairy tales, but it's, I will discuss my science. <laughs> so, okay. So this, we can use the combinations. So, no, no, it's, a, it's some sort of recovering. I don't know this how we can, uh, I think it's a better to, but we don't have a hard drive. Uh, yeah. Because it's, yes, uh, sorry. Where is, why are you, oh, okay. <laughs> no, I have my, uh, I, okay, one sec. Sorry about it, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. okay, sorry. Which one did you want? Uh, could you just, uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, before, 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 before. Yeah, uh, here, here, yeah. yeah, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So I will be fast. Super resolution. Just really this illustration. So we scan with sharp pipette. We position pipette. We go outside. We clip pipette. And with the clipping pipette, op, we go back to the T-tubule and we record the ion channels from the open T-tubules. Okay. Uh, it was the postdoc who uh, did this work and uh, who found the functional channels in the T-tubules and no channels in the crest. But when she patched the heart failure cells, uh, she found uh, a lot of channels in the crest and they, these channels have a different characteristics. And I have an amazing postdoc in my lab, Hase, who just check the human heart from human heart failure patient. And he found uh, uh, in the cardiomyocytes with the dilated cardiomyopathy, 
We also have a lot of channels in the crest, and these channels have a, a higher open probability. And uh, he found that we have an overexpression of the beta 2 subunits of L-type calcium channels in these cells. So uh, this is a um, work from um, Post, um, PhD student from my lab, Marina Balacheva, and uh, Alexei Gluchov, who is a postdoc in, uh, in my lab, but who already got a position, professorship, assistant professor in states. Uh, they found the um, functional ion channels in the atrial myocytes are different from the functional ion channels in the uh, ventricular myocytes, and they distribute both in the T-tubule and in the crest. So this is my beautiful schematic, how we can study the coupling between the L-type calcium channels and beta-adrenergic receptor, how we can activate the channels through the pipette. So question uh, to answer, does the special distribution uh, beta-adrenergic receptor and ion channels impact on function in ventricle and atrial cells? And evidence for functional compartments of calcium signaling complexes with G-protein coupling uh, adrenergic and muscarinic receptor? And do structural remodeling associated with atrial fibrillation and heart failure affect the special distribution and biophysics of L-type calcium channels? So, we apply our combination for study this uh, microdomain, uh, question, um, uh, functional microdomains, but we also the combine the scanning conductance microscopy with the surface confocal for studying nanoparticles entry in respiratory disease. And we published a couple of papers in collaboration with Professor Terry Tetley when we show how nanoparticles go to the lung cells and when we show functional interaction between the charged nanoparticles and cardiac tissue. Also, we combine the, our uh, microscope with the pressure application for study valve disease. And in collaboration with the Dr. Adrian Chester, we show the site-specific mechanic properties of valve and the telial cells. And uh, also this now we can scan the open aorta and we study the atherosclerosis with, together with Professor Jane Mitchell and we uh, can resolve the endothelial cells in a different part of aorta and we found the different mechanical properties, the different part of aorta of peak heart. So now, Yuri, I can answer your questions. What we can do with the scanning and conductance microscopy and how we can apply the, this technique and other application for study a lot of cardiac disease, a lot of cardiovascular disease. And now I can say this journey continues. More discussions, more questions, because this is pictures from my lab meeting when we discuss how big microdomains. And just, I think, before the acknowledgement, I want to say the big thank you of my family, my husband Ivan, uh, my daughters Polly and Vera for support, for help, and for, for patience because it's, uh, without my family I can't do anything. So, and I would uh, really want to acknowledge that my group now and uh, my collaborations in Imperial College, I talked about some people, but uh, my collaborations with uh, uh, Prakash, uh, Nav, Thomas, and uh, um, also the collaborations outside Imperial with Manuela, uh, Sasha, and um, Mario, and Natalia Trajanova from Hops Hopkins University. So thank you very much to uh, my funding body who support my work. And thank you all friends and families who came here to see my lecture. Thank you very much.